podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everyone. On your Tuesday, we are so excited that you have joined us here at Vanderblumen for our series, The Vanderblumen Network Live. Today, we are going to be talking with the lead pastor of South Bend City Church, Jason Miller, on leading a remote church staff. I'm excited for you guys to hear from Jason because he has had a remote staff the whole time. So this is this COVID-19 working remotely is not new for him and his team. And so he's going to share with you what it's like to always have a remote team and lessons that you can learn in doing ministry um, with a remote team. But before we jump into that and I introduce Tim and Jason, um, we just want to give some clarity because I know a lot of you are probably joining us today and you have lots of questions still about the CARES Act. And we would love to help you with that. We're not going to be diving into the details of the CARES Act on this webinar, but I have put a couple of resources there in the chat feature of your GoToWebinar panel. So right now, head on over to the chat feature and check out our two links. So the top link there is churchcovid19.com. It actually goes to this vanderbilman.com slash COVID-19, but Church COVID-19 is much easier to remember. That is where you can catch all of our replays of every single Vanderbilt Network Live event that we've done. So we had Jay Cranda talking about online church. We had Jim Shepard talking about giving and stewardship. We heard from Tim on Thursday, our very own Tim Stevens, all about staff reorganization, which is a, a reality that so many of us are unfortunately facing right now is having to face layoffs and um, furloughs and reorganization. So if you missed any of those, make sure you go to that link where you can watch all of the replays and view all of our blogs. We're putting out 10 to 15 resources every single week. And so that's where you can keep up with all of that. The second link there, this is the golden page, the hub for all CARES Act details. This is the page where we keep all of Sutton's slides updated, which is the very best resource about the CARES Act that's out there. So you want to make sure that you click on that link where you get to see our Facebook Live that we did yesterday. You'll get to watch that. You'll get to see his updated slides um, and a ton of additional resources directly from the U.S. Treasury and um, many other resources there to help you with questions about full-time employee equivalent and what do I do about federal taxes and housing allowances and what do I check on the ownership of the application form? All wonderful questions. You can um, check out that page there to answer that. You're welcome to ask me a question in the box, but we're not gonna um, ask Jason about those questions, even though that'd be maybe a fun, um, you know, see what Jason knows about the, the PPP program from the CARES Act. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so check out those links. Speaking of the questions box, would love to hear where you're joining us from today. It looks like Kevin is here from Kokomo, Indiana. Hey, you guys, Jason and Tim, the, uh, you Indiana folks. Um, we call Kevin's them Hoosiers or Hoosiers. Hoosiers. Yeah. Perfect. Um, Michelle from Virginia. Um, Oh, Denise says, my church loves you, Holly. You're a rock star. Happy Tuesday. Denise, you just made my day. That's amazing. Denise is a smart woman. <laughs> Denise is very kind. Um, folks from Connecticut. Um, uh, let's see, California. So that's one of my favorite parts is just seeing from coast to coast. We've even got somebody that's joining us from Canada, which is so cool because, you know, these resources like leading a remote team, one of the... Um, even though this whole crisis is devastating and has made so many of us have to face things that we never would have imagined. One thing that I am enjoying is the connection globally that we have to each other because we're all going through this really frustrating and sad and heartbreaking crisis, but we can support each other across borders. And so that's so cool, um, Meryl, that you're joining us from Canada. So we've got North Carolina, we've got Iowa. There you go, Tim, originally from Iowa, Maine, Washington State. So thank you everybody so much for letting us know where you're joining from. Um, it looks like some folks are having trouble seeing the links in the um, chat box. Um, it should be there in your control panel. If you're having trouble with that, feel free to shoot me an email, holly at vanderblumen.com or honestly, just go to vanderblumen.com. There's a pop-up that says click here for the CARES Act. So you can click on that. We're trying to make all of this as accessible as we can. So, um, yes, I think you guys have heard enough of my voice, but for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Vanderblumen, 
been on the team for almost eight years. And it's just such an awesome opportunity to get to support all of you um, across the country and even the world and helping you lead the best that you can, especially in this time of COVID-19. And then I'm joined by the one and only Tim Stevens. He's been joining me on all of these webinars with the Vanderbilt Women Network Live. We're so grateful to have his wisdom. Team Le Tim leads our consultant team. And um, so he is on the front lines of really seeing the global perspective of the kingdom, whether it's a Christian nonprofit or a church and all different types of denominations and sizes and budgets. Um, so Tim, I would love to hand it over to you and have you introduce yourself. And then I'm gonna let you introduce Jason since I know you and he um, go a long way back. So take it from here, Tim. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I, um, I started my, ministry career and my uh, career period uh, back in the 80s, working for an organization called Life Action Ministries. And uh, for nine years, spent time with that organization, working with churches all over the country. It was a really cool time just to see the breadth of the church and um, to be able to minister in, I think, between seven and 800 different churches uh, on site through that season, learning so much that I couldn't have learned um, otherwise. Then uh, transitioned over to Granger Community Church in 1994 and just got real excited about this church that was meeting in a movie theater near my house and started going down there to figure out what was happening in uh, or near South Bend, Indiana, and uh, came on staff there um, as executive pastor. The church was three or 400 in size at the time and got to stay for 20 years and really see uh, what God could do with a group of people that were focused on mission and on target. It was really exciting uh, times. I'll circle back to that in a second. About six years ago, then I transitioned to Vanderblumen Search Group and um, began leading here the team that uh, works directly with all of our churches. So we have a team of consultants that are kind of the front line of our ministry with churches, um, helping with consulting and fill position, filling positions and succession conversations and anything to do with staffing. So uh, segue here to Jason. So Jason and I first met, Jason 15, 16 years ago, I'm gonna say, something like that. Yep. Uh, Jason was uh, finishing up college near the church and we had some huge needs. We were thinking we'd hire, I think you were interning, we were thinking we'd hire you after you graduated and I think we moved that up and said, can we hire you now during, before you even finished your senior year? and came on our team and filled a significant role for us uh, for years. I'll let you talk about that. But uh, we became really, really, really good friends and, uh, you know, ministry partners and kind of locked arms there at Granger together. Then I, uh, when I came down to Vanderbloom and then not long after that, about a year or two ago, um, Jason um, hired Vanderbloom and started working with us to fill a position there. So became a customer, a client of Vanderblumen, and one of our team members worked with them to bring on a fantastic executive pastor a um, year, year and a half ago, something like that, Jason. So year and a half, yeah. Yeah, so uh, awesome. I love Jason, glad he's talking. We, we learned uh, that Jason and his staff have been doing remote um, workspace since they started the church three or four years ago. So Jason, tell us a little bit about um, your background and about the church, uh, the ministry there at, in South Bend, and um, then we'll move on with our conversation. Yeah, I'll kind of pick up uh, with the church that uh, Tim and I worked at together at Granger. Um, so I, I did a few different things there, like a lot of church staffers end up doing over the years. Um, I kind of came in through worship and creative um, and then uh, began doing some teaching. Um, and then had a season on the lead team there with, with Tim and our lead pastor and others. Uh, and then in 2016, made the leap to launch South Bend City Church. So um, our first Sunday was 2017. And so we had about a year there of kind of getting things together. Uh, our original staff team came online in the fall of 2016. And so from then and through today, we've, uh, we've never had an office that we show up to together to work at. Um, I'll, I'll get more into our rhythms and all of that, but yeah, we've been kind of doing the remote work thing as a team from the beginning. Uh, I will echo, I'm a huge fan of Vanderbloom and you guys re really did a fantastic job for us and uh, could not be more grateful for our executive pastor and the help that you guys um, gave us in bringing uh, Matt Grable along to our team. So I'm really happy to be here. Well, Jason, that's awesome. We feel like your family because you've also come, we have a, um, a monthly 
theology lunch and learn, and you've come and taught at that twice, I think, um, with our I think, staff. I think three times. Yeah. Three times. Three times yeah. There we go. So I feel like you're yeah. family to us at Vandal Women. So it's so neat to you know have you as a client, but then also you know help educate our team as we strive to be the very best we can theologically, and and then now serving you know our community through an event like this. So we're so grateful that you're here. Okay, Jason. So the first question I have for you is, why in the world did you decide not to have a church staff office? I mean, in ministry, so much of of a pastor or a church leader's role is to meet with people face to face. And it seems like we're all used to saying, why don't you stop by the church office? So walk me through, you know, it's 2016, or maybe it was before that, um, when you decided that you weren't going to have a church staff office. Yeah, so it's kind of, it's practical. It's, um, it's, um, it's kind of theological, and it's, it's kind of cultural for us. I mean, practically, like, like a, probably any church that gets started, like you don't add things until you need to, right? So if you're kind of coming out of the gate, um, we didn't have a building at first or anything like that. So at the beginning, it was, it it would have been weird to have a church office probably, but we just kind of kept going and waiting for a moment where um, it would become evident that we needed to add that. And I would say we really haven't gotten there yet. Um, it's practical because it keeps us lean, obviously. And that, you know, churches more than ever want to steward resources really well. And so um, we rent long-term space now like so we have a traditional lease but um you know when you're looking at a price per square foot per year you you're you're going to do whatever you can to keep that price low and so it didn't make a lot of sense for us to add that um but i think there's other there's better reasons for it as well um this really keeps us uh, connected to the, the city that we're here to serve um and some of this is kind of biographical for me i remember when i was working at granger with tim i just had a day you know, it's a large church with a really beautiful campus. And I was down in my office um, one day and I was feeling some of the tensions that a lot of us feel in, in this full-time work where you have this sense of calling toward ministry and pastoring. You have all these practical realities and you have your day job and they overlap, but they're not identical, right? They're kind of distinct things. And I just remember looking out my window one day and being really, I felt kind of a sadness because I, I love being a pastor. I feel really strongly about it. And I realized I was spending 40, 50, 60 hours a week in this building, which it was a great building. And I loved working there with my teammates, but um, I was feeling this growing disconnect from the actual like world we were trying to speak to and the place where people live their everyday lives. Um, and now that we've been in this reality where we don't have an office, I think I'm learning even more that um, if you spend 40 hours a week in a church office building, that's going to shape your imagination in a certain way, right? The, all those hours are going to cultivate a certain imagination. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's different in some ways than the imagination that you're going to cultivate when you spend those same hours in like your local coffee shops and community spaces, wherever the, the place that your church is that calls home. Um, I work from home a lot. I like, I can't write a sermon in a coffee shop. That doesn't work for me. Um, but when I need a break from my desk, I don't take a walk around the office. I walk out my front door and take a walk around the neighborhood. And again, it's just, a, it cultivates a different kind of imagination. And so, um, there's certainly some challenges and there's some downside to it that I know we're going to talk about, but I think there's a lot of upside, especially as we try to, um, be churches that are local the way that Jesus got very local, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And before we go farther, uh, Lauren asked a great question and I'd love for you to, help us imagine what your staff looks like. So Lauren's question is, is your staff yeah. full-time, part-time, or a mix? And does this cause yeah. challenges? Which we'll get into the challenges, so you don't have to answer that right now. But I'd love to paint a picture, and maybe even from the beginning when you planted the church, yeah. you know, it's probably started with just you. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. now that it's grown, what does your staff look like as far as roles and size? Um, yeah, paint a picture for us. Yeah, we started with just me, sort of, but I was really anxious to get a team. Um, Really, like Tim and Granger talking a lot about um, how a critical team is. So, um, so anyway, so uh, as we're getting going, we brought on three other full-time staff members. So, going into our launch, we had four full-time staff, and then um, that got built up to where, um, and and we have been mostly full-time in the people that we've added. That's just been sort of a case-by-case -case thing. Um, so we we're actually in the middle of some transitions right now. But if I go back until like our most recent sort of arrangement. Uh, seven full time and one intern, and um, and we're about to. Some of that's changing right now. Uh, yeah, is sure. that, did I cover that? Yes. I was and go ahead. Tom. I was impressed with the um, 
the emphasis um, you guys at South Bend City Church put on team from the from day one. You know, churches, executive pastors, especially, always talk about you know the ratio of staff dollars to overall budget. Well, really, on day one, it was 100% staff dollars because right. there was nothing else, no other expenses. And so, obviously, it's a little bit different now. You got a lease, and you're you've got some ministry expenses. But I think that was. I think that, you know, so many church plants fail, and I know that's not the topic of today's conversation, but I think one of the reasons why you guys are four years into this and going strong with hundreds gathering is, is because of the emphasis on team. Mm. That's yeah, awesome. Genuinely, this is not self-deprecating. Some of that was a concession to my weakness. Like, I, <laughs> I just couldn't imagine getting into this without some um, complimentary strengths around me. But yeah, it's been really, we, we're really grateful that we've been able to do that. And we've got some great questions coming in, Tim, to that exact point that I can't wait to dive into, specifically about how do you facilitate culture and team without a physical place um, to gather. But before we dive into that, um, would love to hear, Jason, let's focus on the benefits. So what do you feel like are the benefits that you experience as a team of, you know, seven full-time people? I know it might change as everybody's staff looks different today than it did three or four weeks ago um, because we're all like job descriptions out the window. We got to do what it takes to, to make, yes. you know, this Sunday happen. But um, yeah, walk us through the benefits that you have experienced as a team and as South Bend City Church of not having a church staff office. Yeah, I'd say the first one is, I kind of alluded to it already, but I, I honestly think our imagination is more shaped by our context because of that. And so whether we're dreaming about like a preaching content or we're making a decision about what to do as a church on something, um, the, the more hours that we're spending connected to our context, um, the, the better we are. Um, you know, when we do, some, and sometimes we do a team co-work most weeks, which obviously doesn't happen right now, but we'll pick one afternoon a week and just all show up at a coffee shop. You can all work on your own thing. But, you know, any given week that we do that, um, while we're in there, we're seeing members of our community. Uh, it's a little bit like um, seeing the species in its natural habitat, right? <laughs> like, believe it or not, like your sanctuary is not the natural habitat of the people that you're serving, right? Wow. Um, but but everything else out there is. And so, um, so again, we I think we it helps us think about um, how people are actually living, the questions they're actually asking uh, right here in South Bend. Um, I also think you're going to attract and retain a different kind of team member. Um, you know, uh, and we might get to more of this as we talk about challenges. Um, uh, when when you kind of have a an eight to five or a nine to five sort of uh, external structure where everybody be at your desk, be in the office, that's not bad. Um, I, sometimes I actually do better work in that kind of space myself too. But um, I, you know, you're going to some people are going to benefit from more external structure. But I think the kind of leaders that often um, lead well in church because church is a strange environment. It's an adaptive environment. It takes a lot of self-motivation. Um, I think the, the less you impose a lot of external structure, the more you're going to attract and retain the kinds of leaders who themselves are really adaptive and self-motivated. Uh, so that's a real uh, benefit to it. Um, and then I, I also just think like it, um, it just keeps you from getting a little weird. I don't know. Like, I think <laughs> it can be really easy to forget that these church jobs that we have in some ways are really different um, from the world that the people we're ministering to actually live in. And it's just a nice little check on, on that sort of balloon life that you can live inside a church staff. Um, I, I just think it's really helpful. So Tim, I'm curious, hearing what Jason is sharing about the benefits that his team experiences when most of the churches that you work with day to day are totally opposite. They've been in an office. I mean, we have clients where their church is over a hundred years old mm -hmm. and their office culture or rhythms, the structure that it creates is, is part of, um, has been there for a really long time. So I'm just curious to hear your thoughts because what Jason's describing is a very new idea for a lot of people who are on today's webinar where they can't even imagine their team outside of the walls of their church office. So what are your thoughts on, you know, on just um, the metaphorical, but also literal phrase of like crashing down the four walls <laughs> and yeah. thinking outside of the typical church office. No, I, uh, yeah, I, I love the concept. I, I mean, the biggest takeaway so far from what Jason said was this, you know, when I leave my office, I'm not walking around the hallways, I'm walking through the neighborhood and that's where the people are. And those are the people we're trying to reach. That's what this church exists for. So now most churches, uh, 
are going to have offices when this is all done and people are going to have places. But I think like if there's a new way to think about that, even though you have an office that gets our gets our you know our ministry folks, people on the front line, kind of out into um, the community. Meaning, like instead of doing all of these meetings with congregation members at the office, maybe we're meeting them at a coffee shop or at a restaurant or someplace out in the community, some kind of commons space. Um, I love that because you get so you can get ingrown. It's like Jason said, being um, in an office 40, 50, 60 hours a week, you forget what's happening out there in ministry space. That's huge. Mm -hmm. And I love it too, because from a business perspective, you know, all of the advice that you would hear would be, you've got to get closer to your customers. If you want to grow your business, you've got to get close to your customers. And from a ministry context, Jason, that's basically what you're saying in the sense of, um, you know, being as close to the people that you want to walk through your church doors and be a part of your church community in order to really connect with them and understand their world, you've got to be near them. And I think we all know that, but it's easy to to get out of that mindset when you've got a to-do list of 50 things that have to be done for, for Sunday. Um, so your, your yeah. words of encouragement there is really inspiring. I, and I just want to like underscore too, it's also like deeply theological, right? Like the story that we are here to live in is the story of God, you know, coming to us, right? Like the, the entire movement of the story is, is, is God coming into our space, into our lives, into our flesh, into our world. And so I think if the church is going to be a place that sort of finds its way of being in the world from Jesus, uh, not to like, I'm not saying that if you have a church office that that's like wrong. I'm just saying there's a real gift in it. And, mm -hmm. it, and it's a way of um, following the pattern of Jesus and our kind of way of working. Oh, absolutely. So let's, we talked about the benefits and we've got so many awesome questions. So I want to make sure that we are able to leave plenty of time for questions. So now that we've talked about the benefits, what are the challenges? I mean, you guys have been at it now for several years. I'm sure there's been, you know, different lids that you've hit where you've had to rethink systems and processes. So walk us through some of the challenges that you've faced and how you overcame them. Yeah, uh, one that comes to mind is I think um, adaptation or customization is really important. And this is something I've actually really learned by watching our executive pastor, Matt Grable, as he's um, come into leading our staff as well, because he's really good at this. Like, um, just be on the look, I got to be on the lookout for the fact that like for some people, this is the best natural setup for them. Um, maybe they don't have wife and kids or husband and kids at home. And so home is a pretty great place to work. Um, maybe they're an introvert and they love that. Um, others are going to have a really hard time with it. Maybe they need more external structure or maybe they're the kind of person that thrives on the hallway conversations and the impromptu collaborations. So I think one thing is important to do is like look out for how this affects different people on your team differently. And it's taken me a little while to, to remember that and learn that for our team. Um, another challenge I think is like for your church, if, if your church was used to knowing that they can come to the office to find you and you take that away, or if you don't have that to begin with, it's not okay to leave that neutral. You need to make up for it by like going to them. If you're not going to put yourself in a place where it's easy for them to come to you, it, it's not okay to just leave that neutral. You need to find proactive ways to show up um, in their spaces. Otherwise, I think you do end up being a bit of a ghost team, and that's not good. Um, I think assuming the best can be a little bit harder when you don't see each other at your desks every day. Um, it's going to test trust a little bit. Um, you know, of course, the funny thing is, like, having worked in a big church office for over a decade, like I'm painfully aware that just because somebody is at the desk doesn't mean they're doing work, right? Yes. Um, so I think it's easy to like equate, oh, I saw you at your desk. I, I trust that you were working. Now we're remote. I, but I think a more realistic tack, first of all, remembers that just because you saw them at the desk didn't mean that, you know, they're really getting the job done. And conversely, um, if you know your team and you trust your team, hopefully not seeing each other eight hours a day doesn't mean that you're going to have a harder time assuming the best, but uh, that can be hard. Um, I think it can be really hard to know what you can expect from whom and when. Um, like a lot of church staffs have maybe you take a weekday off. And I know some teams, the whole team takes the same weekday off to kind of make up for working Sundays. Others, it's different. Um, we have leaned pretty hard toward like work your own hours. But then it's really important that we know who's on when. Um, if I send you something on Monday, are you working on Monday? Can I expect a response on Monday? Uh, um, 
are you trying to take a day off on Monday? But you think the fact that I sent you something means I'm trying to crash your day off. Like, mm -hmm. I think it's really important to like be upfront, like, hey, so like for me, for example, um, before we came to suspended gatherings and coronavirus, uh, Friday is kind of my rigid Sabbath. Um, I'm trying to be really protective of that. So like almost every Thursday night for the last four years, um, I've messaged our staff team and just said, hey gang, uh, I'm gonna be shutting, like I'm gonna be like disconnecting around midnight tonight. And then I'm not gonna check back until Saturday. If an emergency pops up tomorrow, call me. Otherwise, love you, praying for you, but you're not gonna get anything from me tomorrow. And I do that every week or most weeks. And it's been my pattern, even though by now they should know that. But I think um, it's important to make sure we know when we can expect things from each other. Um, so I'm just kind of working through my list here. I hope this isn't too- Yeah, like, no, this is gotten. perfect. Keep going. Uh, another thing that you lose when you don't have um, a shared workspace is like, it, uh, my background is mostly in creative. And so this probably looks different in different teams, but I think everybody has some version of like the big whiteboard in the meeting room or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And the gift of that is that you got a bunch of individual heads around the table, all with their own ideas. And you might've said one thing, but each person heard a different thing, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And um, you're trying to work to a place of shared vision and in physical spaces, the way that you can really do that pretty easily is like you, you externalize it in a, in a visual sort of medium where all these individual sets of eyes are looking at the same sort of agreed upon, hey, this is where the idea is going. This is what we are creating. And the good news is there's, there's lots of digital tools that are really good at this. But if you don't know about these tools, um, you might be at a loss, right? So maybe I'll tick through a few of these real quick. Yes, we've been practicing. Okay. Yep. Uh, so Slack is um, a tool. Our team doesn't email. Um, we email externally if you're not a part of our staff, but as a staff team, we use Slack, um, which is a really common and popular tool. A lot of groups use it. I think you guys use it at Vanderbilt. We do, yep. Um, Slack is, mm -hmm. it's like a, a little tool. It can be on your phone or on your computer and you can message one another in, in individual DMs. And then you can create channels for all the sort of areas of work that you work on as a team channels can be accessible by everyone on your team or you can restrict a channel to certain people so you know we have a finance channel and we have a communications channel so when our team is kicking around a question about the email newsletter that we're going to send out on wednesday that tends to live inside the communications channel and the great thing about it is we'll have a conversation in slack or we might have a video chat but at the end of it we can kind of dump our conclusions into that channel and say okay here's what we said we said that on wednesday these are the big ideas that are showing up in the newsletter and it just creates a, a better likelihood that we're on the same page um mm -hmm. and slack's great google docs is so kind of basic mm -hmm. but if you're not aware google docs is great we will often edit a document together in real time so you can go to uh, google docs like drive.google.com um you can create a, like a, a word processing document or a spreadsheet. You can share it with everyone. And not only can they see it, but you can actually work on that in real time. So I could be you know, on a video chat um, with three other people and we're shaping our language around Easter. And I could type a sentence that somebody else could say, I think it should look more like this. And it's like a digital whiteboard that we can work on. Uh, one other tool that I think is really helpful is Trello for group project management. Um, that was one we used in creative when I was at Granger. Um, Trello sort of mimics the way that a team might have a bunch of different like cards on a board that you're moving around, you know, ideas, um, projects that are in execution, elements that are gonna go into the service and you can kind of track their progress and get people to see them and be assigned to them. But the one thing I would say is pick your tools and then learn them really well. Mm -hmm. Like. It doesn't really do to have a team that's sort of using a tool, but kind of uncomfortable using it. That's going to be really hard. So I would say pick the tools that are best and then commit to them. Like put in, put in, you know, a half day right now to learn it. And then the rest of the time that you're working remote, it's, it's going to save you time just because you put in the time to, to figure it out right now. Um, that's yeah, great. the other challenge, some of the other challenges I would say are, are, are more relational, less tactical. Um, you know, I think um, I try to like, we'll, we'll do a video meeting or whatever. And I'll think about the fact that at the end of that meeting, if we were in the office together, anybody who wanted to, they could have lingered in my office. Maybe they had something personal they wanted to talk about. And it would just naturally be the thing that they bring up at the end of the meeting because they don't want to bother you. So I'm just trying to like make sure like, you know, I, I do a lot of phone calls. Just, hey, can I call you? And often it's, I don't even have an agenda. I just, the only connection we've had this week has been in a video meeting where we were talking about a project but I don't want to lose the, the kind of soft side um, 
connection and, and, and pastoring that we try to do with our team. And so I think it's just really important. Um, it can feel like a heavy lift, especially when you're first getting used to this new, new realm. But I think um, just make sure the relationship space doesn't get lost or squeezed out when you're being really tactical online. It's really uh, good. Yeah, that, all that comes to mind. I have a question, Jason. You mentioned as a as a benefit um, that it attracts certain people, um, that that kind of you know remote and flexible work environment attracts certain kinds of people. Um, and and those are people that like independence and they like to you know they're kind of self starters and and they're self motivated. Does it or can it also attract people who might be the opposite of that? Might be like lazy and don't want the accountability. Yeah, yep. Um, I think that's something to really look out for. Um, and I know that like, um, we've wrestled with a little bit of that. And um, like, one of the things we've asked ourselves is, if that's a problem, do we want to pivot away from like, do we go to office hours? Like, we've, we've asked that. Um, but our, our sense has been that we don't want to like, design our team culture. This kind of, I don't mean this to sound harsh, but like in, in this context, like for the lowest common denominator, yeah. I'd, I'd rather design a team culture that is optimized um, for for effective leaders, and and then we're going to have to deal with um, that on a case by case basis. But yeah, I, that's definitely a thing too. That's great. And Jason, two things you said um, as you're running through um, on the challenges part, um, setting those expectations. You said when you were speaking of your own Sabbath. I think that's key to your point, Tim, for those people that you do attract that are very highly motivated people. Um, I, I'll just speak for myself. A lot of times if I get an email from my supervisor, I just assume it needs to be done immediately. And that's, that's on me to not feel like I need to jump at everything immediately. But it's really helpful when that supervisor, like you're saying, Jason says, you know, hey, I'm going to be... Uh, well, A, says when they're not going to be available. Like, hey, please don't bother me. If you need me, I'm going to be out on Friday. So if you need anything for me before then, please get it to me by Thursday at noon. But then on the flip side, if you're just wired to where you love to work at 8 p.m. and for whatever reason, you just get a lot done, to go ahead and tell your team, hey, you're going to see some emails come through. You're going to see some slacks come through late at night. Do not feel like I will let you know if I if I need you to do that immediately. I think um, setting those those expectations are really helpful um, for your team so that they don't feel like they have to leave time with their family or stop everything they're doing every time they get a Slack or an email um, communication. Um, so I thought that was really good wisdom that you shared there. Something to add on that, Holly, too. Um, we've encouraged our team with Slack to um, to snooze, you know, so you can put it on snooze so you don't get so. I may be working, and this was true, especially for our, my team that is mostly on the road when it's not pandemic season. Mm -hmm. So we can be on another time zone getting stuff done at, you know, it's it's uh, eight o'clock our time, but it's 10 o'clock in Houston. And it can it can feel like, OK, we're pushing stuff through to someone. But but we just encourage you put put it on snooze when you're off work. So you're not going to get notified. Keep your status updated. So if it says in a meeting or if it said, you know, so we know that. And then if it's, you know, we try to, um, we do we do use email some still. We try to kind of say, okay, if it's really, really urgent, call me or text me. Um, if it's just kind of general work uh, throughout the course of communication of a day, Slack. And, and if it's a file that you want to share that you want to kind of keep long term, Slack is great for that. And then if it's like, Next time you're working, this is lower priority than send that through an email. And um, it just kind of, you know, gives a sense. One thing you said, Jason, that I loved um, on your Sabbath thing, I love that when you communicate that every Thursday night, um, not only are you reminding people you're out tomorrow, but you're also modeling for people the importance of work-life balance and you're communicating to your staff. It's okay if you also have a Sabbath. In fact, um, this is something that we value in our culture. Yep, absolutely. And I went ahead and put up my next question for Jason here because I feel like we're we're already answering it, which is great. <laughs> which is yeah, how do you yep. effectively communicate within your remote environment? So you've walked us through some awesome tools there. Um, and you've also walked us through setting those expectations. Are there any rhythms that you feel like you haven't talked about yet that help you communicate effectively? Like one question I have is, do you ever meet together in person? Is that regular like every week right. or does, is it just kind of one-off meetings when people need it? Walk us through those rhythms on a weekly basis. 
Yeah, so in normal life, pre-COVID, um, yeah, we 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 go to our the space like our our our, our church building. We we just lease kind of part of a of an old factory in South Bend. So we don't have offices there, but uh, on Tuesdays we're there together as a team from like nine to two. Um, like we wanted to recover a little bit of like so like we had a kids ministry director who you know she needs to be in those rooms sometimes. Sometimes there's like some physical labor like moving stuff around, and we didn't want her to feel like always alone in that it's like you know she leads kids ministry but we're a team so what if there was one day a week where she just knew that like others of us are around we can help each other you know um one of our team members who especially thrives on like social collaboration we need to just create some space for that to happen so we don't have an office there but on tuesdays we're there together and then we do that co-work rhythm um later in the week so yeah that that really matters to us um, I think we've already kind of talked about this a little bit i learned a phrase from uh some friends at cross point church in Nashville, mm -hmm. uh, we took our team there to learn from some of their rhythms. And one of their t uh, team best practices is use your blinker. Um, they're like, you know, you're driving down the road and you, you're going to switch lanes or take a turn and you may not feel like you need to use your turn signal because it doesn't help you. Um, you. You might be able to navigate without doing that. But the point is, it's a way of respecting the other moving parts around you. It's just respect the other drivers. So one of their mantras is use your blinker as a team. Um, and like, and I heard in that, like everything from like, just again, it's proactive status updates. It's like, Hey, I, I know you asked me for this. Um, just, I'm letting you know, I'm still working on it. It's been a couple of days since you heard from me. I don't have it done yet, but it's still coming your way. Or, Hey team, one, you know, I'm, I'm taking a meeting on X or Y and didn't want to surprise you after the fact with it. So I'm just letting you know, I'm going to be having this conversation. You might be hearing from me later on it. Um, that builds a lot of trust, I think. And then not using your blinker, not proactively sort of indicating where you're going ahead of time um, can really degrade trust and create a sense of disconnection. Um, yeah, you know, you're in a meeting and somebody can kind of nod and you know that they heard you, but on Slack or email or whatever, like just a little thumbs up, got it, heard you. That stuff goes a long way. And I think it's a kind of relational intelligence that we need to like proactively cultivate. Um, again, it's not the kind of thing that makes you feel like it helps you, but it helps everybody around you. And I think, in a digital space, it becomes even more important to be really thoughtful about what your teammates need from you so that they don't feel lost or out of loop. And Jason, I think that's huge from the leader's perspective, because I think that some leaders do have this mentality of, you know, well, I shouldn't have to worry about how I come across. I'm the leader. If I say it, it needs to be done. Or if I, you know, whereas mm. I think this new world of digital communication uh, you will get so much farther faster <laughs> with your team. It will work harder for you because you will build trust. If you are thinking about how is what I'm typing being um, perceived. And so I think that what you just said is crucial for lead pastors, senior pastors. If you're at that leadership rank, don't just assume that people are, you know, going to do whatever you say and don't worry about how it comes across or how you're typing it. I think it's really critical yes. that we as leaders take the responsibility to lead with positive communication and make sure that everything is really clear and that people aren't making up their own stories because we didn't use an exclamation point or a smiley face emoji yeah, or yeah. <laughs> whatever yeah. that might be. Yeah, and we, we're losing body language. I mean, I know like communication theorists talk all the time about how the actual words are just a little bit of what's communicated. But if you're on Slack, all you have is the words. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think you better get really thoughtful about all of a sudden those words became 100 percent of your communication so they'd be able to, they better be able to carry the freight that in the in the in the office your body language your warmth mm -hmm. a, a chuckle like that kind of stuff carries a lot of freight relationally um but we're losing that when we're, we're like this yeah yeah and something that one i think that oh go ahead tim sorry <clears throat> I, I didn't mean to interrupt um one thing that uh, so my team's been remote for um ever mm -hmm. so we uh we're all on the road traveling um, over the weekends often and then Monday through Thursday and then Fridays kind of we're in each other's space um, in our offices. That's all been true pre pandemic. Um, and so we've had to kind of uh, figure some of these tools out. And I was thinking back to when you said um, the relational piece um, is so crucial. So one thing my team started that might be useful um, to you all in this season, especially um just for a relational touch point so we were always having friday all staff meeting or all team meetings for our all of our consultants together every friday during this season we've also added 
um, Monday touch points. So we just, Monday, it's a 30 minute, you know, what's going on, what's in your week, how can we help you? Not required because if they're, um, uh, if they have a meeting already scheduled with a, a client or a church, then we don't want them to cancel that, but it's just, it's there on the calendar. And another thing we started about six months ago before even this whole COVID thing is, um, is a, a Wednesday afternoon touch point. Um, so if you think about uh, in the in the real world, uh, you know, people at the end of their day often will gather with their friends, sit around a bar and have a drink and have a conversation right before they go home from work. So we call it virtual happy hour. Uh, mm -hmm. Very, very rarely does anyone have any uh, thing more than a Diet Dr. Pepper in their hands, but, mm -hmm. um, but it's just a connection. It's on Friday, it's on Wednesdays rather at four o'clock. It is completely non-agenda. It, so there's no like you can't talk about your work it's just like how are you doing um, what's going on how you feeling and it's virtual so we just do it on a zoom screen and there's um, eight or ten of us however many can make it um, and we found that even before this season but especially in this season to be really a way for us just to kind of keep the relational piece going because that's what's missing right now when we're all stuck in our basements and our home offices um, is a space for that. And Holly, you guys did something like that with your team recently that 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 included more movement than what we do. That is true. <laughs> Our first week working from home, um, we had a couple comments of folks that missed that connection because at Vanderbilt, we have an open office. And so we're all used to being together um, quite often. So they're missing that personal connection. And then I, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I was also sore from sitting all day. Like I'm not, I usually have a standing desk and I'm walking around and I'm, I'm a pretty active person. And um, so we did, our team did a, um, on Slack that Jason talked about, you can do calls, you can do video calls. And so we just did a group video call and we all just did 10 push ups and like 10 squats or something. I don't remember, but, um, and yeah, it was a little weird and awkward at first, but the goal there was just, we're together, we're moving, like, take 10 minutes, let's get off our chairs and we're connecting, we're laughing together. And so just a, a quick moment like that um, can be really helpful to build that that bridge. Um, and, you know, maybe even in non-COVID times, it, have a walking meeting, you know, just to be active with your team, I think is, is really critical. Okay, Jason, I wanna move on to my last question. And while you're answering this one, I want everybody to put your questions for Jason in the question box. We've already got um, some really great questions here, but would love to hear from everybody. We want to make sure we get to your questions today. But Jason, I would love for you to share advice for leaders who are, I mean, we're all in a remote environment right now um, for the first time, but what would you encourage leaders who, who a lot of us just want things to go back to the way they were, right? It's like, I really miss going into the office. I miss my rhythms, the routines that I've been in, some of us for years. And so what would you say as an inspiration or encouragement of letting, having people take maybe what they're learning through this season and take it into um, once we can gather together again? Yeah. So first of all, I would say um, for everyone watching, but also for the teams you lead, um, like, first of all, I'd say make room for the fact that a lot of us have lost the most rewarding part of the job, or at least our connection with the most rewarding part, which is, I, I know for me, like when I actually am with our church on Thursday nights or Sunday mornings, when I see people who are growing and changing and like, that's the prize, like just to actually hear the stories of, of how God is sort of showing up in these lives and feel it together. So it's like, we're all working really, really hard, but a lot of us have lost that. Um, so my first word would be like right now, just kind of as a word of care, which is uh, for everyone watching and for your team, just like, it's okay to grieve that. Like, like I, I record my sermon podcast at my desk now. I actually get kind of choked up sometimes when I'm sitting here um, because this that's the moment when I would be talking to my church in person. I would see them and we would be together and we've lost that for this season. Um, so I would say make room for that. It's not good to lead when you're, shoving down grief and loss no make room for that bring that into your leadership that'll actually make you a better leader um this takes new muscles so go easy on yourself and your team right now have a lot of grace but keep driving um but ultimately i would say that um like this is a moment of profound opportunity i think we need to seize it um i i know it's tempting to want to get back back to normal i think um the wiser perspective is to remember that we're we're, we're never going back I'm not saying we won't recover a lot of what we had before this, but um, so reality is we're not going back. 
right? Um, this, um, I don't, I'm not an epidemiologist, but it sounds like COVID might become seasonal. Um, large group gatherings might become suspect uh, again and again and again as this thing flares up. People might feel unsafe in that space. Um, so I think wisdom says we're not going back, we're going forward, but theology reminds us that like, I mean, Easter's on Sunday, right? Um, resurrection life isn't just a return to pre-death life. Um, I was just listening to two friends this morning, uh, Luke Norsworthy and Annie Downs were doing a podcast together. And Annie said this really brilliant thing. She just said that when um, Mary saw the risen Christ, she thought he was the gardener. Um, because apparently resurrection looks different than the life that we had before everything died. Uh, it's not just going back. And so I think um, like Easter is a great moment for us to ask God, what is it that's dying right now? And like, don't don't cling to what was, but ask God what's next, and then move toward that. Um, I know that can be really hard. It can be exhausting, um, but what a great moment for us to remember that like all of our tactics and strategies and worship services and all that stuff like that was never our mission. Those are just tools for the mission. This is just a great moment to let that be refined, uh, to be kind of open-handed, uh, and to ask God to show us like what what we could let go of and what we could learn right now so that we can kind of keep up with what the Spirit's doing. Um, I, I, I don't mean to minimize how hard this is, um, but I also think there's a lot of beautiful opportunity in it. Absolutely. And I do think, you know, my biggest takeaway from what you've shared today is, is just to for all of us to remember, how can we get closer to those that we are serving? How can we get outside yes. of our church offices? And I know we can't right now, <laughs> can't get out of our homes. But when we are able to, to just um, on a daily basis be thinking about, how can we get closer to our community so that we can really make sure we're meeting their, meeting their needs well um, with our jobs in ministry? All right. Are we uh, ready to jump into some, some questions? Um, we touched it. on this a little bit, but Meryl is asking, so if you have anything else to add here, great question. How does a physically disconnected staff develop a sense of team and community? So any other advice for how you can build that team culture and trust when you're disconnected on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, some thoughts are like before coronavirus hit, um, we were trying to be really mindful about some. So if our day to day life is perhaps a little more disconnected, then to make sure that sort of we compensate for that with some more intensive sort of opportunities. Right. So, um, you know, retreats and all day sort of like um, we have we are mantras or our values, we call them our mantras. We have four mantras. And. Um, every quarter we try to take a whole day together and have a whole day experience built around that mantra, but it's very experiential, it's shared, it's together. So if your day to day is, is less physically connected, I think you need to make opportunities for more physical connection. Obviously right now that's not available to us. Uh, I don't know that I have great answers to be honest. I mean, we do, um, we do our team meetings online and we try to, if we have a two and a half hour video meeting with our staff, there are weeks when the first hour might be, how is everyone? You know, go around, tell, tell us what's going on, ask questions, let's hear from each other. Um, and then our uh, matter executive pastor has a practice, <coughs> excuse me, that we do three, two, one every week on Slack. It's just three things you're working on right now because we can't see your work. So three things you're working on, two things going on in your personal life and one goal for your work week every week. And then awesome. um, everybody fills that out in advance on Slack. And then again, in that meeting every week, it's who wants to ask anyone about anything in their three, two, one. And it's interesting. And Matt predicted this because he had seen it elsewhere. You can ask anything, but most of what we end up asking one another about is the, the two, the, the personal stuff, you know? Um, uh, yeah, so that, those are just a couple of things that we do. I'm not sure if you guys have other answers, but I know you guys have some of the same challenges at Vanderbilt. Yeah, Tim, I think you're sharing the virtual happy hour um, is a great, a great one. What other ideas that do you guys do on the consultant team to provide community? Well, I know our uh, <clears throat> culture team at Vanderbilt uh, is focused on this. And um, when, you know, pre pre COVID, they were um, planning things every week or two um, just to help kind of pull culture together and do something fun together. And, and even in this last couple of weeks, I don't know, was it last Monday or Tuesday, we had a uh, culture event and it was just mm -hmm. fun. It was just a, it was just a fun game. And there was like, I don't know, 32 of us or so on the screen uh, having fun with this game for 20 or 30 minutes. It was just kind of a, a way to interact with each other when it wasn't all business or agenda. And it, and it just said, you know, we, you know, you matter, we matter. This is our, our work's important. It's okay 
to take some time out. I know uh, teams do things individually, but that was kind of fun company wide to do that last mm -hmm. week. We also had Denim Day. So this is a tradition we've had for <laughs> years at Vanderbilt. I have no idea how it started, but we once a, a year, we all dress up in our, you know, Canadian tuxedos, <laughs> our, our <laughs> denim, and people have fun with it. And so we did it remotely. And that was so fun. It was on a Friday. So we have our all staff meetings on Friday mornings. And so everybody showed up on Zoom and it was, you know, all 30 of the boxes and we all got to show our crazy denim outfits. Tim was rocking a denim hat. Um, and so even virtually, it was fun. And we, you know, we're sending pictures in our Slack channels to each other of our denim that we had on that day. So I think just, you know, little things like that, that doesn't cost any money. It doesn't, it's not a lot of planning. It's just a connection of we're all sitting at our home desks. We're wearing denim. How goofy is that? But it just brings us together, which I think is, is really helpful. All right, um, Jason, what is the most effective task your mobile staff does on a week-to-week -week basis? This is from Adam. It's effective task. I mean, I, right now, I would just say the most effective thing we're doing is like every one of us, I think, is calling and reaching out to like church members, volunteers, stakeholders every day. I'm just working through a mental list. Sometimes I will just literally visualize a Sunday morning, look around the room until a face pops out and call them. Um, and I'm, I'm learning that from our church people um, that that's really, it doesn't, it's very valued and it doesn't have to be an hour long phone call. It might be a text message or a five minute phone call just to say, Hey, I just, I thought of you today. Um, that's kind of unique to having lost our gatherings. Um, as far as effective tasks, like before that, like just in general, I, um, yeah, I mean, maybe it's like, as far as, as effective as us working together goes, um, I think it would probably be the three, two, one that Matt has led us in creating. It's just Which, it's so simple, but it's so helpful. Jason, can you repeat that? I actually got like five questions yep. of everybody wants you to repeat. The th and so yeah. I'm gonna write it here. Actually, let me get ready in the chat box. So, uh, okay. What yeah, so and let me take it into the context. So when we met in person we went on Tuesdays and on Monday, every week, Matt would remind us, send your three to one of the group and we'd read it ahead of time. And on Tuesday, we talk about it. It's three, what are three things that you're working on right now in your job life? Just just what are you working on right now? Three things. Two is what are two things going on in your personal life that you want to share? And that could be everything from like, sometimes like it's, oh, well, I've got an Airbnb rental this weekend, so I'm cleaning up to get ready for it. Or it mm -hmm. might be, oh, uh, my son is going through some mental health challenges and we're trying to figure it out. And it's crazy that like, I, I wouldn't have known about it if we wouldn't have done this, you know? And then the mm -hmm. one is what's one goal that you have that you want to knock out by the end of the week in the work. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So everybody, I'm typing this here in the chat. Um, sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to talk. Again, I just want to, I just want to reiterate fun. all the credit for that goes to Matt Grable, our executive pastor. It's been a really helpful tool that he brought. Aren't you glad Vanderbilt helped you find him? I am so glad. <laughs> I'm very, very glad. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay, yeah, we got lots Let's of questions. That one at Holly. That's good. I know. That's you know, VP of business development. I got to do it. Um, okay, we've got six more minutes, so let's try to move a little bit faster here. Gordon says, which I love this, why not use video more often in order to minimize the communication gap of using only words? And Gordon, I completely agree. Communication is one of my strengths finders. It's really, really important to me. And um, a lot of times, even if I'm sending an email, there are so many awesome tools. There, one of my favorites here, I'll put it in the chat box, is Soapbox. It's by a company um, called Wistia. And it is so easy. It's a Chrome extension. So you just add it to your Chrome browser and it can record your screen and you at the same time. So if I'm trying to, if I'm explaining mm -hmm. something that I feel like might come across confusing, or I know that people aren't going to read the whole thing and they're going to reply like a whole reply all channel thing, which drives me nuts. <laughs> I'll just make a video so they can see my face. They can hear me. They can hear my heart. They can also see my screen if I'm explaining something really technical. Um, I honestly even use that a lot when I'm checking in with folks that we're talking to at Vanderbilt and with our, our work. Um, it, I'm not here to, you know, just get that sale done. I want you to hear my heart and why I'm following up with you. And so I found that tool um, to be really helpful. So totally agree with you, Gordon. Another thing, Holly, uh, in, within Slack, um, it has video calls set up. You just hit the little phone button at the top of the screen and you're immediately slacking with either that person or that group. And so sometimes, you know, you're trying to get past the words, you just want to see people. It's really easy to do. You don't have to set up Zoom or anything else. Perfect. Can I throw one yes. more note on that too? Just yeah. um, if you imagine like what kind of thing you're talking about, 
sometimes I think of like there's tactics, strategy, vision, and then there's relationship. Mm. The lower you are on that list, I think the more written communication is fine. So tactics work fine in Slack. Strategy is a little harder to nail down. You might need a video call. Vision's even harder. You better. You might want to be in. You might want to wait till this is all over and you can be in person. And the relationship, I think, like really calls for picking up the phone call, picking up the phone, right? And like if there's any kind of conflict. So I, I kind of like picture that hierarchy. And the higher up I get, the more I lean into video face to face, and I stay away from uh, just typing a note in Slack. That's great. And Tim, I think this is something you've taught me, but that. Um negative feedback or critical feedback should always be in in verbal or in person or video if you can't meet in person and positive feedback should always be written so people can, can go back to it and i think that is something yeah. you taught me that i take with me I, mean, I use that every single day as i'm leading a team um jason how do you loop in volunteers throughout your remote leadership yep yeah, great question that's really important here's the good thing it actually in some ways levels the playing field um, because if you have like your staff in an office, that's sort of like a, a kind of a privileged space. And that can feel like an, a bit of an impermeable environment uh, for people who are not on staff. This actually levels the playing field. We're already working in a coffee shop. Like, so like one of our core volunteers might walk in. It's not uncommon for us to be in the middle of talking about something in the coffee shop. And then uh, Michael walks in. Oh, hey, Michael, this, this is actually, this involves you. Can you just like jump in on this? Um, and now we've been doing like, um, like right now, uh, Matt and I are doing um, video uh, meetings with all of our, our, our group leaders. And so we're we're breaking them out. So seven or eight at a time, me, Matt, and our group leaders, we send them the questions in advance. And it's, how are you doing? How's your, how's your group doing? And what could we be doing better as a church right now? Those are incredibly mm -hmm. fruitful conversations. And we're just teeing them up. And what we're finding is that right now, people are really hungry to help the church rise up to this moment. So right now is, I think, a great opportunity to pull people in. That's awesome. What do you guys do? This is a Holly question with uh, confidential conversations or counseling or pastoring one on one. Where do you have those meetings? Yeah, um, often the, that stuff will sometimes happen at our church building. We also there just happens to be a public space in South Bend. It's this big atrium between a hotel and another thing, but it's indoors, but it's like a big greenhouse. And it's got it's it has enough white noise that you can find a corner and have a really confidential conversation without it being awkward. So. We, sometimes we joke that it's like the north offices of South and City Church because we just stake <laughs> out there. That's awesome. Good to know. Well, um, and then Meryl asked uh, one last question. I'm going to pray for us before we head out. What are some keys to having a great home office space? How do you create a good working space to not be distracted by other home influences? Any advice, Tim or Jason there? I, I would say, yeah, for this kind of thing, um, think about lighting, think about uh, backdrops and think about um, just distractions, noises, things like that. So you can't see it right now, but I've got a I've got a blanket hanging to my left just to block the glare from the windows over here, just to help um, so it's less distracting on the video. Um, I've got a little little light up here that helps just kind of brighten things. So just think about things like that and distractions. Some of you are in spaces where you've got kids or dogs or uh, you've got uh, college kids that are home learning, and you, you, so you got to make do with what you can. So it doesn't. It doesn't have to be um, perfect, but there's some small things you can do for that. Yeah, I would just I would just double up on that and say also like whatever you can do to create a threshold first, even if it's even if it's that corner of the living room is only for work. Um, mm -hmm. I think in the short term you may not think it's necessary, but um, I'll say for me having worked from home, the first three actually I worked from home even at the end of my time at Granger, and uh, it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I had a dedicated home office. And I've been surprised at how psychologically helpful that is. And I don't even have a wife or kids at home. So I, I, I'm not, I don't need to like separate that, but it's just, um, it's so helpful to say, this is my work spot yeah. and it's, I'm only there when I'm working. Yeah, that's been helpful. We have a little tiny 1000 square foot house and I'm upstairs because I have trouble turning work off. <laughs> and so I think that that has actually been really helpful to have me upstairs and my husband is uh, better at turning work off than I am. And he's on our at our dining room table. And so I think that's worked really well to have to create that boundary for me. And he's he's been helpful to say, Holly, it's six o'clock. Stop, you know, get off the email or whatever. So um, it takes 
you know, I think a lot of agility and and figuring it out where you are to do the best you can right now during this um, this crisis. Well, just want to remind everybody, our team is here for you. Um, we are offering to hop on the call with you if you need somebody to pray with, if you need somebody to talk through really hard um, issues with, whether you're having to reorganize your staff or deal with layoffs. Um, you know, we are here to help in any way we can. If you want to talk about remote team culture, we'd love to talk with you. So you're welcome to email me at holly at vanderbilman.com. Jason, thank you so much. We love cheering you on and watching you guys thrive mm -hmm. at South Bend City Church. And um, I would love to pray for us as before we go. Dear Lord, thank you so much for bringing us together with our friends from all over the country and even the world today on this webinar. And Lord, we just pray blessings on Jason Miller and the team at South Bend City Church. We thank you for the amazing work you're doing in and through them in the community. We thank you for Jason's leadership and passion to get as close to your people right there in South Bend as possible. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would um, that they would be healthy physically and also as a church. Lord, we pray for um for people to draw closer to you and become further disciples of you, Jesus, through the ministry at South Bend. And we just pray um, a special protection on them right now during this crisis. And we just thank you for everybody who joined this webinar today, Lord, that we would all feel your peace in a time of uncertainty and anxiety, Lord, that we would just surrender to you each and every day and often many times throughout the day right now, Lord. And we just know that you are in all of this, that you are sovereign that this has not surprised you, Lord, and we are thankful that we serve you, our great, great God. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody, make sure you check out churchcovid19.com where this will be posted either later today or tomorrow morning. Thanks so much. Thanks.